This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. My grandfather's name is Dennis Field and he's about to turn 92 and I like to try and get down and visit my grandparents fairly regularly but often finding those gaps in work is really tricky and I sometimes only get down a couple of times a year but from the minute I arrive he starts to tell stories, stories of his time traveling the world as an export manager, stories of his time on the stage as a semi-pro opera singer and most recently he pulled out two photo albums talking me through his time spent with the Royal Navy as a 17 year old from 1945 to 1947 at the close of the Second World War. When he arrived in Hong Kong in late 1945, he bartered a packet of player cigarettes for a box brownie camera because he wanted to document the trip that he was on and this incredible experience that he was a part of. And so he started to take photographs from Gibraltar and Malta in the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, Singapore, up to the very north of China, Japan, down through Malaysia into Australia. And as he told me these stories and flicked through these beautiful images, I found the whole experience really evocative. Sitting and listening to those stories and being able to see the photographs that he'd taken reminded me of what a powerful medium photography is in storytelling. When you combine first-hand accounts told with images of the time and space, time and places that you and I will never be able to visit, it's a really complete experience. When I went down to visit my grandparents just before Christmas, I set up a couple of cameras and asked him to talk through some of these stories and show some of these images. So I'm gonna do a favor in this video and not talk very much and hand straight over to him. If you're a fan of history like me, I think you'll find the stories on their own fascinating. I mean, we all know about those years in World War II, but what happened in those two or three years afterwards when the world was trying to rebuild itself? But even if you're not interested in history, I think looking at him talk through his images will get you thinking about your own photography differently. Not just taking images for today, but how will people in 30, 40, or 50 years view your images? So I'm gonna keep quiet now and hand over to my grandfather, Dennis Field. I was 13 years old when the war broke out, so uh, by 1944 uh, I was old enough to volunteer. Uh, I didn't volunteer to serve my country, believe me. I volunteered to get the hell out of a war factory I'd been working in. I should point out that I much preferred the uniform of the German Navy but by 1944, it looked as though they were losing. So I thought, being a very intelligent young man, I decided to join our side. At that time, radar was in its infancy. And I remember when we went to our first lectures, I went into a small theater. There were guards on the door. And the first thing you saw on the screen uh, was a message that stated everything that you see and learn from this lecture is a closely guarded secret, disclose it for no one. So at 17, for the first time in my life, I felt quite important. I, I had the non-substantive rating, as they called it, of a petty officer. I was uh, an RC1, which meant that I control f a crew of 14, those responsible for navigation and those responsible for gunnery. Another good reason for taking radar, if you took an ordinary seamanship course, it took a month. Uh, therefore, I, my, my uh, course took nine months in total, so that kept you out of the fighting. Very intelligent. Um, by August 1945, we had the, the Japanese, uh, and the, the war with, with the Japanese was ended, and we set sail. There's the ship, HMS Bigby Bay, Bay-class frigate. Mm -hmm. They were specially designed 
to ward off kamikaze bombers. Wonderful experience, imagine, 17-year-old, never been out of the country, first stop Gibraltar. We went from Malta to uh, Alexandria, uh, and then down the Suez Canal. We're in Colombo in November, in Ceylon, or Sri Lanka as it is now. And from there, Singapore, December. Singapore mm. does not look like that now, no. I promise you. <laughs> then we went on to Hong Kong, arrived in Hong Kong for Christmas. And I thought about, perhaps it's the first time I thought seriously about photography. So um, money, of course, is always a problem. I think we were paid about a pound a month, but uh, cigarettes were of a bar to value. So I went into Hong Kong and with a tin of 50 player cigarettes, which cost me one and sixpence, that's about seven and a half P, I was having to buy or barter my first camera, a brownie. So from that point onwards, I was primarily shooting photographs of the ship's crew and our immediate surroundings. Pincher Martin, a, a ra radar, great friend of mine, Noel Botwood, Botsy, he was another radar operator. Most of these guys were, were radar, but all these were taken with that wonderful little brownie box camera. Mm. Who's this uh, handsome guy? This handsome guy <laughs> is me. Believe it or not, I have a photograph in one of my albums, mm. which I saw the other day, of my father wearing that same shirt wow. in 1936 in wow. Paris. Wow. And 10 years later, I'm wearing it in Hong Kong. Wow. The, the, this is uh, 293P4 for navigation and uh, that photograph, the, all these were taken with my box camera mm -hmm. and enlarged somewhat. Mm -hmm. That's me there when I used to smoke mm -hmm. a, li a little. <laughs> all these guys are radar, Noel Botwood again, Pincher Martin. If I'd have been caught taking a photograph of that, I would have been in serious trouble. Right. Although the war had ended, mm. it's, it was still a secret. Yeah. That was uh, an A-scan for picking up fast-moving aircraft. This, this one behind my head was for surface vessels. We had arrived in Hong Kong, and this is what the time I bought uh, the brownie camera, right. or bartered. Yeah. And I started to take photographs yeah. on my own account, February 46 where we used to go swimming on that particular bay there. Mm. Very interesting, it's the there's the bay mm -hmm. and this hotel, the Lido Hotel. At that time in 1946, I would have been shot if I'd have tried to cross the threshold of the hotel yeah. because it was reserved entirely <laughs> for the upper classes and for the officers only. So tough, you couldn't go in, but at least we could go on the beach. Hong Kong, think of, think of Hong Kong <laughs> yeah, now. Absolutely. Now it, there's Stanley Mound, the mm -hmm. highest point, and there are masses of skys like that now. skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. Then we had the great day. Mm -hmm. Admiral of the fleet, Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, came to inspect the ship's company. <laughs> and eventually, the, and the Guard of Honor, the Admiral came round mm -hmm. and he, he chatted to one or two of us and he gets to me and by that time 46 so just before my 18th birthday and looking very young blonde blue eyes and very young and he said uh, how long have you been in the royal navy and i said i hate him man, sir he said do you like it i said not a lot sir <laughs> and my captain i swear if he if he could have put that sword through me he would he, he you do not tell admirals <laughs> that you don't like the Navy very much. But it was charming because he said, oh, you'll get used to it, you'll get used to it. <laughs> this was very, very sad. This was Sub-Lieutenant Williams, who was 22 years of age. He went ashore in Tinsin, uh, as fit as a fiddle, came back on board, not feeling well, fell into a coma and died. Mm. And we was buried at sea. Mm. And the sailor there, that's my back. Mm. I was one of the burial party there. Mm. Oh, that was um, 
I can even pick me out there. Mm. That's me. This is a battle cruiser, the, the Barfleur. And we're, at, we're actually tied up in the Yangtze Kiang, the, right. uh, the Yellow River. Yes. And this was a Sunday morning service. This is my ship, the Bigbury Bay. And we went on board the uh, battle cruiser for Sunday morning. We then spent, uh, say, one and, one and a half years cruising. Sounds luxurious, doesn't it? Cruising, yeah. Went down to Australia. That was I was in Australia for th three months. The ceremony of crossing the line, mm. June 1946, a very, very old naval tradition is when you cross the line, you have to be baptized by Father Neptune. <laughs> and here you've got Father Neptune. And if you've never crossed the line equator before, you get ducked in a, in a, in a, a big tub here right. by your shipmates. Now, I must one day, I've thought about it, mm. I must one day send these photographs to the city of Darwin mm. because that was Darwin in yeah. 1946. I even made a comment here, Darwin's jetty, mm. exclamation marks. The impression I got was I was walking through a Hollywood set mm. for the Western mm. with dirt roads and th this was the cinema. Right. And you, you might just about see a steel outline of a star. It was the star cinema. Th this was Darwin in the middle of uh, winter in uh, June, yeah, June 46, in the middle of winter, and we were wearing white tropical shorts, very, very warm. Mm. <laughs> right, then back to reality. We, we left Australia after three months, refit. And we went up to um, Malaysia, we were in Malaya. And these photographs I took in Malaya, Kuala Lumpur. And it looks nothing like that now. Mm. That was the British Malaysian Army headquarters. That still exists, mm. that magnificent building. That's still there. Mm. Port Dixon in Malaya, we, we had some um, leave. So shore leave, and we, we booked into a, a, a camp. Mm. Yeah, we're all, all in, that's me in white uniform there. Yeah. One monkey, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. me and Scouse. <laughs> uniform you don't very often see, but that's your, the tropical uniform mm. for the Royal Navy. So that's me again. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had a body. <laughs> It doesn't look like that now, I can tell you. <laughs> Nothing like that now, yes. This, I bought this in Japan. Mm. It's, you've got this uh, pagoda. Mm. Yeah, I bought it in Japan, the original. Kyuri, Japan, mm. place we went to. Now, while we were in Kyuri, not a million miles away, was Nagasaki. And this is the photographs of Nagasaki of the devastation of the atom bomb. Mm. The, I suppose the interesting thing about this is we hadn't got a clue about radiation. Mm. I doubt we could have spelt the word, let alone, <laughs> let alone understood it. So we toddled into Nagasaki and uh, I, in, in the rubble, I picked up what had been a small green glass bottle and in the heat of the atom bomb it had twisted and melted into a grotesque shape mm. and I also picked up what I, be I believe was a piece of soil it was in a ball it was solid it was as solid as a rock but it mm. definitely wasn't a rock mm. and I can only assume the heat of the atom bomb mm. had, had somehow or other solidified it changed its it's, it's, it's makeup. Mm. Anyway, these were souvenirs. So I put them in my pocket and I take them back on board. Hadn't got a clue the danger that I was in. Yeah. But some wonderful shipmate of mine <laughs> stole both the bottle and the piece of soil. I don't know who took it, but maybe he saved me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, we went to Kagoshima and we took on board 14 Japanese war criminals. Mm. They're guarded by 
our crew on this occasion, but the Australians as well, Australian guys, mm. they, they were on board. All those 14 war criminals, and we took them to Singapore for trial and execution. Uh, just very briefly, one was uh, a Japanese admiral or vice admiral. Oh, by the way, all these little plaques mm. w was their name and a number. And on the ship's notice board, there was a, there was a, a, a statement which gave the, the name and number of each one of these men and the crimes that they w had committed. Yeah. And in the, the reason we had the Australians on board, the Admiral was commanding a battleship, large battleship. They sank an Australian destroyer. Uh, which went down, going down, but going down slowly, but they took nearly 200 um, survivors on board. Right. And uh, at sea, the Japanese get bored. We all get a bit bored at sea, you know, seeing miles and miles of ocean. So they thought it was a good afternoon sport. They brought 200 men onto the quarter deck of the battleship. Mm. They split them up, half on the starboard side, half on the port side. And while one half watched, they decapitated about 100 men oh. on the one side and threw the bodies into the sea. So we got him. This, this one, I hope you yeah. can see it. He is a Japanese prisoner of war. Mm. He'd been, we had him on board ship, a Japanese prisoners of war on board as the working party. Mm. And I, as they were leaving the ship, I stood at the bottom of the gangway with my brownie box camera, mm. ready to take photographs of some of them as they came off. And he's running at me mm. to try and knock the camera out of my hand. Oh, gosh. But I did get the photograph. Mm. So now we're in Damascus, mm. Syria. This is in Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, and. We, uh, we had a, we took a bus and we went from Beirut, St. Paul, the prison St. Paul was mm -hmm. suppo suppo supposedly mm -hmm. lowered by a basket from there. Yeah. And the great mosque of Tukai. Mm -hmm. We went, my friends and I, went <laughs> into the gardens <laughs> of the mosque of Tukai. Well, that's obviously me in uniform. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, that is me smoking a hubba bubba pipe. Mm -hmm. That is also me, and that's our radio uh, radar mechanic together. Mm -hmm. And there was a stall selling these these uh, the Arab jalabas and so forth. And uh, but w w we couldn't afford it. We, we hadn't got that sort of money. And uh, they suggested we'd like to try it on. Mm -hmm. So we tried it on and, and they took photos of us. You don't want to hear about the... Uh, oh, I do. You do? <laughs> of course I do. Uh, you do, right. Well, she was used as a troop carrier. Mm -hmm. So we picked her up in Malta and on December the 7th, 1947, I was coming home after two and a half years abroad. So we were loaded up and there were 2,000 of us in the hangar, massive hangars, mm. no, no aircraft, of course. So we had our hammocks and we had tables and we were happy little sailors all playing cards and what have you. And we have a seven day journey. Ha ha ha. We thought we were going to have a seven days uh, comfort. On the f second day out at sea, all of us were mustered on the flight deck mm -hmm. and we were designated into various working parties. And uh, I was designated with a party of about 12 of us. And they, this officer, a lieutenant, took us down below and to a bomb shaft, a bomb lift, mm -hmm. if like. And he said, no, the, 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 the thing is, chap, is, he said, we have this, um, we have this bomb lift. He said, this is where the bombers come up from the magazine. And they, they come up to the flight deck and the bombers are fitted onto the aircraft. Uh, and as you can see, very deep. Normally there is a small lift that brings the bombs up, but there is a steel ladder that goes right the way down. He said, now, if you chappies have a look down there, um, you'll see that 
oh, to quite a considerable depth. It's full of shit. <laughs> because, gentlemen, the sewers have been leaking into the bomb shaft. He said, now, we, we would like you, if you would be so kind, to get down there and clear the bloody lot up. Uh. So 12 of us spent one and a half days uh. with buckets and ropes pulling up the sewerage. Uh. And we did make a minor complaint. It's probably to have made a minor complaint and said, you know, a fellow can, can do this, it could do a fellow a lot of serious arms, uh, breathing in all this stink, you know. So, so they've brought in the medical officer, and he was a lieutenant commander, so he was, he knew his job. And uh, he looked down, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. Not bad at all, not bad, not bad, not bad at all. No, you'll be all right, fellas, you'll be all right. So we carried on, and after one and a half days, we'd finished the job. So on the third day, we mustered on the quarter deck again, on the flight deck, shall I say, for another designated job. And we were delighted to hear, over the megaphone, the first thing they announced was, will Operation Stinkhole Lating Ratings, Fallout, you are excused duty for the rest of the journey to the UK. <laughs> That's so <laughs> we went back, so we didn't have to. Oh, so th gosh. that was my memory of the um, great aircraft carrier, 32,000 ton illustrious, <laughs> was cleaning all the sewerage out of a bomb shaft. <laughs> my God. <laughs> They're wonderful periodically to, to take them out, to look back, back through history, 50 years, 60 years. I mean, I'm 92 nearly, and I started when I was 18. That's a, a big span. They, they, they re recall uh, very happy memories, starting with the ship's crew. I, I took so many photographs of the ship's crew. <laughs> they were great mates. Uh, there was a... Um, I had, uh, there was a group of us, all, all radar, radar or wireless telegraphists, and the, they, they were guys who felt the same as I did. You're never going to see this again. I never dreamed that many years later I'd be going to these places again, including Hong Kong and, uh, and, and the Pacific and the, in Asia on, on business. So I, I took what photographs I, I could take and uh, I bought photographs where it wasn't possible for me to take them myself. And uh, it's, it's, it's just great. It's, it's something to pass on. Mm. I mean, my, my, some of my albums start with my great grandparents. So I go, the, you go through from great grandparents right up to the, the uh, 21st century. Wonderful, wonderful record. And as I've made it very, very clear to the good Lord, if I can't take my, ab my albums with me, I ain't going. <laughs> I captured about two hours of interview footage in total and it really felt like weighty, important work. I love the fact that this stuff is now captured digitally. I've got it on hard drives forever and it's been 
archived and that feels important. And I wanted to share more with you as well, but obviously in this video I can only fit so much. So what I've done is I've done a longer cut of this interview that's about 35, 40 minutes. So if you wanna hear more of these stories, I will post that video to my YouTube channel as well and you're welcome to go and spend some more time with that material. I'll post the link at the end of the video. My grandfather's photographs make me think about my own work differently. I think with a lot of our photography, we can be very myopic, very in the moment and now. So we go out and we take photographs, a lot of them, and we edit them quickly and we post them quickly because we want that instant feedback from Instagram or anywhere online that tells us we're doing a good job. But getting out of that and thinking about things broader, his work reminds me that I am not just capturing for today, but I'm capturing as a legacy for the future as well. And how will people in 2070 or 2080 or 2090 look back and view the images that I've taken? I even think about it in terms of the street photography that I'm taking here in London in 2018 and now in 2019. The fact that I'm going around and looking for good light and trying to take images with good composition, but the subject matter I sometimes take for granted because I see the same buses and taxis and clothes and cars and, and makeup and tattoos and buildings is stuff I'm used to because I walk around every day. But when I've taken these images and archived them well, and if they survive 30, 40, 50 years, how will people look at those images and where I live here and now in London. It's taken that very narrow view of what I'm doing and spread it a lot wider and a lot deeper into history. My grandfather's work has reminded me that I might be or I can be telling stories to future generations if that's how I want to think about my work. And it might change the way I shoot, it might not change the way I shoot, but just having that at the forefront of my mind when I'm shooting adds another dimension, another element to how and why I'm capturing these images. I mean, sitting with him on that sofa while he told me those stories and showed me those images, I found an incredibly evocative experience. And I've now started to daydream about what might it look like when generations down the line, I can sit with or, or future people can show my images to their kids or grandkids, showing them what the time and space that I lived in was like. And it's almost like you can become a storyteller through time. So I hope, if nothing else, it gets you thinking about your own photography, gets you thinking a little bit wider, a little bit deeper than just shooting for today to get a little bit of attention. What stories could you be capturing? What legacy could you be leaving? And what sort of images could you leave the world behind and what would you want them to say? Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you need a new website or a domain, they really are a fantastic option. I've been with them for about seven or eight years now. And I have to say, starting off a new year, making sure all my images are up in galleries, the ones I want people to see for the year, all the correct products are loaded onto my store, the right information is on my website, really feels like me putting my best foot forward online right up front. And the fact that their designs make my work look really good, it's a nice clean, minimalist layout, there's 24 seven customer service support if anything goes wrong, and it just takes such a weight off to know that I'm beginning the year right. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and go to squarespace.com forward slash Sean Tucker to get 10% off your first purchase.